Okay, so in this 10 minutes, we're gonna talk about a couple of different theorists' perspectives on social class, specifically Karl Marx and Max and Max Weber, Max Weber, but it's pronounced Max Weber. You probably have heard me talk about Karl Marx before. He's somebody that I I get kind of excited and when I want to talk about. But Marx, and I don't want to spend my whole 10 minutes talking about just Marx, because I also want to discuss Weber. But basically, Marx's idea was that there were two, and this is a quiz question, there were two social groups, there were two social classes. There were what he called the capitalists and the workers, um, the proletariat and the bourgeois, the people that owned the fact, sometimes I use the R-rated um, explanation, I call them the pimps and the prostitutes, but they were the people that owned the means of production, and this is a really important concept. What do we mean by means of production? The way that stuff is produced, that's the means of production. If you own the factory, if you own the restaurant, if you own the farm, that's your means of production. So you own the factory, you own the farm, or you sell your labor. And that, in that case, you're the worker or the proletariat. The bourgeois, if you may be the phrase bougie, the bourgeois were the people that owned the store, that owned the factory, that owned the farm, that owned the rental property. And then it was the proletariat that came to the farm to work, the workers that came to the factory to work for nine dollars an hour, the workers that come to the McDonald's, those were the those were the proletariat. So you have the owners and the workers. And Marx's theory was pretty straightforward. The idea was that these two groups of people, that they would be in competition with each other. The owners would want to get as much labor from the workers as possible, and the workers who would want to get as high as wage as possible without with doing the least amount of work as possible. And this is where that conflict theory came in, right? And so that there would be competition and conflict between these two workers. And we've talked about alienation. The video that is synced up to this um, to this chapter also talks about alienation. But alienation is a is an emotional and social experience of the workers and those people that came and effectively they sold their labor, they sold their soul for nine dollars an hour. And this made them uncomfortable. This made them feel comfortably numb or alienated from themselves because they had no control over what they did. You know, if you've ever worked at one of those jobs, and this is what I've asked you in the video, have you ever, you know, kinds of jobs you like or in the assignment, right? Have you ever had one of those jobs where you just like, you just wanted to get, you know, eight hours closer, just your life would get back to normal after eight hours. And that's the, what we mean by alienation, the sense of disconnection, that whatever you were doing was, you just went through the motions and you didn't have any sense of ownership or connection or this was meaningless other than the, the paycheck. That's what alienation was. And Anyway, so that's what we're, and, and then Marx theorized that all social problems were caused from this sense of alienation, this disconnection from ourself, and that through work, we could find meaning, but because so many of us were in these jobs that were meaningless, we were just being exploited. We were just like, you know, horses pulling the wagon, that this made us unhappy, um, and that all social problems were about this disconnection from ourself and from our work. It was. Anyway, so that's sort of Marx's in a nutshell. Uh, Weber, though, Weber said that class was not as simple as if you owned the factory or if you worked in a factory. But he theorized, he argued that there were the three P's, the three P's, power, property, and prestige. And social class was multidimensional. And depending on where you sat in that triangle was determined by how much, um, or in your slide, it shows property, it shows wealth, wealth, the stuff, right? The stuff that made money, that's the definition of wealth. And, or you could have social status, right? That's what prestige, people could regard you in a positive way, or finally, you could have the ability to influence people, and that's what power is. So our, you might, so for instance, a priest who takes a vow of poverty, has no, no wealth 
but has tremendous social status and can influence people. They had a different social class, right? A movie star might have wealth and prestige and but might not but might be able to exercise people that or influence people to do things because of the social status. I also think about like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Who gained prestige through his Mr. Universe that gained him economic wealth and his economic wealth then gave him social power as he eventually became the governor. All right, so all of these different ways. So basically Weber said it was more complicated than what Weber, what Marx said, as did one of Marx's students, we'll talk about in a second. Our social structure, and if you can look at, um, if you can look at your textbook, often it's described as this ladder. So social class, there is not an agreed upon definition of how many social classes or what the rank is. Every textbook has, has a difference. Some of them have capitalist or upper upper class or lower upper class or middle lower or upper middle, but the point that is consistent of all of these is that the further down you are on the social class ladder, the less connected you are to the labor force. In other words, there's a group that's sometimes referred to as the underclass. And the underclass are these, the, the first, last ones hired, the first ones fired, the temporary workers. Often students are kind of part of the underclass because when they, they can get a job, but as soon as the economy tanks, they hire fewer students. The further up on that social structure, right, the more influence you have over the labor force. So the further up, the more people you can hire, the more the, the power, you have power to make decisions about the number of people below you to hire. So that's what's consistent. Um, what's also consistent is the distance from the actual work or what union people like to call the work of the work. The people at the bottom, they're doing the work of the work. They're picking the strawberries, they're repairing the holes in the road, they're hammering the boards that build the buildings. The people at the top, they're the ones that are making the economic deals um, to decide how many people to, 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 to hire. They don't do the work of the work. They make the decisions that affect the people at the bottom that do the work of the work, right? So they decide how many people to hire. And if you look at that chart, you can see where it talks about like education and wages, but I'm, I'm going to argue that this is really in flux. And as we come out of this, this strange time, maybe, maybe there'll be some attention drawn to these low wage workers, specifically fast food workers, grocery store workers that right now have our, are very significant to the functioning of our so we would put them close to the bottom because they're considered low skill and low wage but they're really important right now so this might change their uh their relative rank that's in a couple other a couple lecture a couple other lectures where we talk about theory um anyway so i'll let you look at that but finally then if you move to the next box right the next box, which is really more about uh, some of the Marxian theories, but this one highlights one of Karl Marx's students or colleagues, Wright. And what Wright owned, or what Wright argued, was that there were actually four social classes, right? So Marx said there were two. And Wright says, no, nah, it's a bit more complicated. And he specifically drew attention to the managerial class and the small business owner. And he argued that the small business owner was much like, uh, he called him a petty bourgeois because the small business owner was both employee and exploited and worker and owner. And so they had what was referred to as contradictory location. The small business owner was like exploited himself, so to speak. And you couldn't put the petty bourgeois, small business owner, the small bourgeois, you couldn't put them in the same category as worker, nor could you put them in the same category as owner. So Wright said it was a little bit more complicated uh, than Weber, which I happen to sort of agree more with Wright than with Marx. And the next one, we'll talk about inequality and some of the theories behind inequality.